going straight away. So, so thank you all for attending today. Um, as Eloria said, this is going to be a 90 minute session and it's really um, to speak to you about EOSC and how the work on EOSC is progressing, particularly in terms of the task forces. So what we're going to talk about is the priorities um, and the ideas and the resources for the next phase of implementation. So I'll start with a, a brief introduction on the task forces and we can take any questions um, around the process and the status of these immediately after that. And then we have a panel um, with um, five participants um, and these are representing the different advisory groups which are the kind of overarching um, placeholder for the task forces. So Britta Dea um, will represent the implementation of EOSC advisory group, which covers aspects such as research engagement, PID policies and rules of participation. And then Ignacio Blanca will represent the technical challenges on EOSC. I'll cover the metadata and data quality advisory group and the two task forces within that. And then we'll hear from Gustav Nielsen on the research careers and curricula and from Bob Jones on sustaining um, EOSC, which is the long term preservation and the, the kind of funding models. So what we'll do in terms of the panel, we'll, we'll each give a short introduction to let you know the current status, where the task forces are at, um, what the key activities on those task forces are, and also um, what the strategic priorities are in the Shreya. I don't know if many of you will have been involved in previous Shreya consultations, but we're now at the stage again within the association where we're starting to think about the the work that needs to be done in the forthcoming work program. So not the one that's already drafted and is starting to be implemented, but the next one for 2023 to 2025. So we need to have this long-term strategic vision and that's something we'll also invite um, inputs on from you. So um, to get us started, I'll just, oh, I'll just come to share my screen and share this presentation. Uh, let me just put this onto full screen. Hopefully you can see that okay. If anyone can't, just um, shout out or let me know somehow in the chat. And um, what I want to do in this next kind of 15 minutes is really just to step back and let you know how things are running with the EOSC Association Task Forces. So first off, an explanation of what the task forces are. These are really a structure that's been set up by the EOSC Association, which is the legal entity that's governing EOSC, to help the community at large to steer the implementation. So previously, the executive board had a series of working groups, and these task force structures are very similar to that. We have more task forces than we had working groups. We have 13 task forces, um, and we've grouped these into um, advisory groups. So the advisory groups are, uh, I guess, a little bit more like the working groups we had previously. And these um, task forces are going to liaise both with the EOSC projects, but various national initiatives and others, other groups and organizations that are implementing EOSC. And this is really to offer feedback on the work and to help kind of shape this co-creation of EOSC. And another key role for the task forces, and this is why we want to pick up on this in this session today, is identifying the strategic gaps and areas for investment. Because the strategic research and innovation agenda is a, it's like a living document. It's something that we repeatedly update at the association to inform the European Commission. And we're now entering into another kind of 18 month phase where we'll be making um, updates to that. And as I mentioned before, the advisory groups are really an umbrella, um, an umbrella body for these task forces to fit into. So each of us on the panel will represent an advisory group, and there are usually two or three task forces within that. And what we've done with the governance of EOSC, the, the directors of the board, we've nominated one director as a liaison to each of these advisory groups. And this is to make sure that the work that's happening in the task forces can feed up to the board and also the board can can kind of support the work and help coordinate um, through those through those task forces and advisory groups. So Suzanne um, Dumachel is the liaison on the implementation of EOSC. Unfortunately, she can't be here today. So Britta has very kindly stepped in to represent that advisory group. 
Ignacio is um, the liaison on technical challenges and myself on the metadata. And then um, Wilhelm on research careers and curricula. This is who Gustav is representing today. And then Bob Jones on the sustaining, sustaining EOSC. So these are the, the 13 task forces that we have in place under the five advisory groups. Um, and when we come on to the kind of presentation of the current status, we'll talk about the activities in, in each of these groups, what's been drafted in the charter. Um, and that's really to try and understand if there's anything we've missed, if there are any key resources that you're aware of or initiatives that you're involved in that you think we should be reflecting in these groups or consulting and, and working with. So we'll talk about the current activities and then um, give you opportunity to feedback on those. Now, the main thing that's been happening in terms of the task forces, we drafted our charters and we consulted on those at the EOS symposium a few months back. And then we opened applications for membership and we, we received a large number of applications, 545 applications from over 41 countries. So there was um, a strong interest in being involved in EOSC. And you can see here the number of applications we received per task force. We asked people to select one specific task force um, to prioritize their, their kind of engagement. So I think technical interoperability had the most with 67 um, applications. And there were a number of others that had over 50. Um, some of those there's been selections made because these are very large groups. Um, and then there are others where, you know, it was around 20 to 30 or just over um, members. So what we doing over time and those coordinators um, helped us in performing evaluations and made a recommendation to the board and what I wanted to explain is really where we're at with that application processing so the coordinators who'd already been doing the charter drafting and, and had also helped us with the evaluations were automatically accepted. We didn't um, kind of, we didn't evaluate those applications because those people had already been, you know, very heavily engaged in the process. So we had an automatic rule to accept those coordinators. And the European Commission in the interim has also asked if they could have a number of observers. So not full members to these groups, but they wanted to be aware of the activities that are going on. So as part of the application process, they submitted a number of applications um, for people to sit in on the various groups. And we've also automatically accepted those EC observers. And then as I mentioned, the coordinators of each task force performed an evaluation for us. And they made those recommendations to the board about whether they accepted all members or whether they made a selection. Um, and we're in the process of finalizing those recommendations currently. Each board liaison has been looking at the ones that apply to their advisory group and, and the relevant task forces within those. So all the recommendations to accept members have been processed so far. Um, so we emailed out, if you're involved in this community, you may have received an email yesterday um telling you that you've been accepted onto a task force so where those those recommendations were very clear um what we've been doing as a board because we have to look at everything in aggregate not just one task force um, in isolation we've just been doing some analysis on those remaining applications just to cross check them in aggregate to make sure there's no adverse effects we've not managed to exclude a particular country or a particular um, you know, member category, or we're not missing certain skill sets. So before we send out any other emails, um, we want to just make sure that those groups are balanced. And actually on, on the check that we've done so far, it looks like there are no adverse effects. So um, I think we can go with the recommendations that have been made, but we just wanted to cross check that before we email everybody out. So we expect to inform the remainder of the applicant shortly within the next kind of 10 days or so once we've finished that processing and had chance to discuss it as a board. 
So the results that you see here are likely to be the kind of final results. So maybe a couple of minor changes, a um, couple of additional members added in, but I don't think there'll be a major shift from this. So you can see on the left, um, the 13 groups and the number of members that have been accepted on each of these groups. Um, there were six task forces overall that chose <clears throat> to accept all the applications which has meant for some very large groups. So, so technical interoperability is, is a very large group, for example. Um, and the group sizes, they typically range from 23 to, to 67. I think most are around the 20 to 30 mark. So that's a general size of the groups. Um, where those evaluations have been made, so in around half of the task forces, there was a selection and there were a number of people who weren't recommended for inclusion. That was largely based on skills. So we wanted to make sure we had all skills for the, the charters um, covered. And then um, people have tried to bring balance in terms of gender and geography and the organisation type. So typically we've tried to make sure we've not got multiple people from one organization on a task force. I think there maybe is one exception there where it's a large organization and, and people are very clearly wearing different hats and bringing different skill sets. Um, but we've tried to ensure that there's quite a balanced um, participation in the groups. So where next with the task forces? Um, the EOSC Association has set up mailing lists and shared drives. So when we've emailed out yesterday to the various accepted members, um, we've shared details so that the coordinators can begin the work. There will be a meeting for those existing coordinators scheduled for um, the 5th of October at the end of the day. And that's really just to try and um, progress the next steps with them. Because now the groups are set up what we're asking every group to do is to nominate its own chairs. So for people to either volunteer themselves or the groups to, to put forward a recommendation on chairs that the board can then accept. Um, and then once we know the chairs of all the groups, um, we would like to run a coordination workshop, something more in depth that's really looking at the work that's happening across all of the task forces um, and to have um, a more in-depth workshop in October, November time with the chairs so we can make sure that we make the most of the overlaps in the remits. So that's where we're up to with the task forces. Um, what we're going to cover today, each panelist will speak to the kind of the status of the task forces and the key activities that are being pursued in those different groups. And they'll also reflect reflect on the strategic priorities that come out of the Shreya because I'm as I mentioned this is something that will be updated so you know we'd be interested in your feedback on that and then once we've gone through the panel and done the uh, you know the kind of introductions to each of these groups in a bit more detail we'd ask you um, you know if you have any questions or observations you want to share any key resources you want to reference um, and any missing strategic priorities if you think there are aspects that we don't cover as well. So for instance, as we've been setting up these groups, you know, we have a focus on research engagement and software. These are aspects that aren't as well reflected in the Shreya. So they may be things that we want to prioritize for, for future work. So that's how the rest of the session will run. Um, before I hand over to the panel, I wanted to come back and see if there's any questions in chat or by all means, raise your hand. I'll just come out of this view, stop my share, so that I can look at the controls. Um, so when will the members of the task force be published? Um, yes, so that is our intention to ask for permission and, and publish the names. Like we had previously with the um, executive board, we had a page for each of the groups and, and the list of the, the different members. So we would like to do the same again. We just need to make sure everyone gives us permission for that. Um, any other questions on the task forces or the current status? By all means, put in chat or raise a hand. How are the task forces going to work and collaborate with the EOSC related projects and similar interests? Thanks very much for that, Anka. Um, so one thing we've been mindful of when we process those applications is making sure that we have participation from the projects so that we understand what's work, what work is going on in those projects and can also you know, include that in the activities and provide feedback and consult around it. 
I think some of the major projects like EOSC Future um, are also doing their own kind of internal um, organization to make sure that if they have a few people on different task forces, they make sure that there is a nominated contact who's like the lead person for that project, who's going to make sure that they you know, ensure all the relevant work that's coming out of all of the different work packages gets represented in that group and act as a liaison between the project and the task force and, and by, by, the, by that, the EOS governance at large. So I think some of the projects are being proactive in terms of how they use those members that are in the groups. Um, but I think one of the key things will be drawing in the activities happening in the project. So I know, for instance, when we were doing the Fair Metrics Charter, there's been a lot of work that's already been done on the metrics, not necessarily in EOS projects, but in groups like RDA and making sure that we have that as a clear input and that we liaise with that body when we want to give feedback on the metrics and we think things need to be updated based on whatever tests we do within the, the task forces. So that's hopefully that's answering how we're going to do it, how we're going to collaborate. I think largely it will be through making sure there are members who can act as liaisons and if not reaching out specifically to those projects. If that doesn't answer it, Anka, by all means unmute um, and probe a bit more. Or, or put more in chat. And then um, a question from Carolina about how will the information about task forces be communicated? Um, this was actually something we asked people to reflect on in the different charters. So certainly on the EOSC Association website, so eosc.eu, we will have a page for each of the task forces. Um, we will also profile things in the EOSC Association newsletter. But I think, We'd like the task forces to be very interactive. I know many of them, um, you know, have have asked to run case studies or some kind of pilot studies to test the metrics or to to examine different approaches to data quality, for example. So when they're doing those kind of consultative exercises, um, I think that will naturally also be a, a communication route because they'll be going out and working with the community, engaging people in that work. Um, so there'll certainly be outputs and news and you know the reports that get published will be on the EOSC Association website. But I, I think a lot of the task forces will also work in quite a interactive and open way. So it will be quite regular communication. Yeah, so by all means, do sign up to the newsletter. Thank you very much, Federica, for putting the, the details in the chat. There is also a stakeholder registry that's been set up on the EOSC Association website. And this is, we're liaising with the projects to try and pull through relevant contacts um, because we're conscious in the way EOSC has been formed, it's often been quite hard to know where to get information because there's so many projects going on in parallel. So we're now trying to consolidate the kind of dissemination channels and to be able to send things out to, to you know, a more coherent group. Um, so yeah, please do sign up to the newsletter and the stakeholder registry. Okay. Um, if there are no more questions, I think we'll move on to the panel session to hear about the task forces in more detail. Um, and by all means, put questions in the chat as we go through there. But what we anticipate doing is taking maybe the next kind of 25 minutes outlining the work in those different task forces and the strategic priorities, which then will leave us 45 minutes for discussion. And what we really want to hear from all of you is about reflections on the task forces, things that you think we maybe haven't identified and need to be referencing, and also ideas you have for the, for the updates to the SHRIA. If you think there are specific pieces of work that are missing or priorities that we need to, you know, um, add more weight to for the next phase of work. So I will hand over to, to Britta to introduce the implementation of EOSC advisory group and the task forces within that. Yes, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, as Sarah just said, I'm Britta Dreyer um, and I am one of the four coordinators of the PID implementation task force, one of the three task forces aligned under the advisory group implementation of EOSC. And I will 
briefly describe the activities um, as they are aligned with three priorities and the current status of the three task forces. The three task forces are the PID policy and implementation task force, the researcher engagement and adoption task force, and the task force rules of participation uh, compliance monitoring. And you will see that the status of these three uh, task forces are the same. Basically, um, the shadows have been approved. Uh, there are different uh, sizes in groups, and um, but we're all awaiting the uh, final discussion on October 5th, as Sarah just mentioned, um, where we you know, decide on the final um, numbers of the task forces and reaching out to uh, potentially more members, then, you know, sending out invitations to the kickoffs. Um, so the status are very much alike here. Um, the PID policy and implementation task force is aligning with the ASRIA priority, implement the EOSC Pertis, Pertis, Pers, Persistent Identifier Policy, AA1, which is pretty simple in this case. It's this one uh, priority uh, here, um, and the activities are very much aligned with this um, priority, identifying emerging and standardized identifiers, uh, recommendations, about a global persistent identifier resolution or the meta resolver, as it is called in the priorities, um, type definitions for most common data formats, uh, particularly for machine actionable PIDs, um, then understanding the efforts to implement the EOSC PID graph and providing a report on the findings. Um, setting up criteria against which um, PIDs will be certified and, um, and providing best practice PID use cases for the research community and um, you know, in, the, in the concept of the FAIR principles. And the SRAIA priorities are basically um, listed here and they are very much aligned with these activities. I would be just repeating those here. Um, the task force researcher engagement and adoption um, is a quite larger group here with 38 members. Um, the status, as I mentioned before, is the same. Um, key activities, um, these are two main activities uh, here facilitating the engagement of the research community as this is crucial to the success of EOSC, um, understanding the current information position of researchers, identifying uh, communication materials that uh, help bring this current information position to the level needed, uh, encouraging the organization of training events, to gather feedback from, from researchers, making sure that their needs are adopted and covered in EOSC and uh, use the existing initiatives uh, like LIBER and LERU, uh, working with re existing organized research infrastructure clusters and with uh, national initiatives. Um, in the second step, there will be out the following output, there will be recommendations to the EOSC Association uh, on the findings, and then um, there will be actions taken and strategic, uh, strategic actions taken to uh, work with EC funded projects. Um, then there will be a, a set of uh, rewards um, implemented or well, developed, and uh, there are narratives and explan explanations and visualizations developed by this group and to inform the EOSC end users. And these activities are aligning with three different uh, three priorities. Um, for example, the development of open science training, 
um, the rewards and recognitions priority and also the, um, the uh, priority to inform stakeholders or the uh, multi um, the different stakeholders about the developments of EOSC. The third task force, Rules of Participation Compliance Monitoring, has uh, their activities um, laid out in three phases. The first phase will provide the ROP architecture, uh, the, the, the structure of the rules that they would like to def uh, implement here or provide recommendations on. Um, in the first step, they will define what is an EOS catalog and how this will be assessed and to provide a list of these catalogs that fall into that definition. Um, then there will be a list of proposed and requested um, inputs um, from other task forces. And by the way, all these three task forces see that there are dependencies with other task forces and also um, making sure that they, well, as Sarah mentioned before, the members are engaged in current uh, EOSC projects and will also gather input from, um, from EOSC um, projects. So the phase two then will expand on the ROP architecture. They will be um, defining in phase one and then they will provide or develop a monitoring plan to ensure the compliance with these rules of participation. In phase three, there's initial, there will be an initial EOSC appeal group, uh, a proposed setup of an research uh, rules of participation board and um, contributions uh, to SRIA 2.0, the follow-up. Um, and this group um, focuses on the SRIA priority um, of the um, rules of participation, AA8. So that was my brief presentation of the uh, first advisory group implementing the PID. So please. Excellent. Thank you very much, Britta, very clear. Um, so I'd like to invite Ignacio to speak now on the technical challenges in EOSC. Yes, I'm just uh, yeah, sharing my presentation. You. Yeah. I hope that you can see my slides now. Yeah, we do. Just going into slide mode. Okay, thank you so much. So, well, what I will do in these five minutes is to give a very brief outline of how are the three task forces under the advisory group on technical challenges. I work as a liaison to these three task forces. And uh, that we start very soon now that we have, as Sarah explained, make all the process of uh, selecting, I mean, with the help uh, of the coordinators of the drafter coordination. So uh, these three task forces focus on the technical challenges and basically on defining and implementing, implementing at the level of the specification, a technical architecture and the interoperability framework in EOC, as well as a special area of work on the infrastructure for sharing quality research software. It's important to say that, and also, I mean, taking into account a question that has been asked before, that the task forces will not implement, will provide guidelines, will provide uh, landscape uh, information, coordinate effort, and will the projects be the ones that will be implementing? So it's uh, the, the connection between uh, the task forces and the projects will be very strategic and important. So these three task forces will be addressing uh, several operational objectives in this area related to the definition, implementation, delivering of the components for the minimal viable use can, to share openly data publication and software, to provide the technical components for a fair ecosystems, to co-develop the first generation network of European uh, infrastructures, European infrastructure for software. Uh, source code and to deploy and operate an authentication authorization infrastructure framework. That's the, uh, the operation objectives one, five, seven, and 10. So very briefly, uh, taking task four by task four. So you can, I mean, I believe that the slides will be available later. You have the link there to the draft charter. 
You can also easily go to the, um, our web portal of the association and find the links to all the draft charters. So in the case of the AI architecture task force, the objective is to deliver a consistent architecture for AI, basing all the effort for the different activities, AIARC and all the other projects related. So it's important to state that in this task force, 70% of the um, of the members of the applicants come from service providers and there's an important presence of uh, key projects there so we guarantee this link the outputs that they expect is to develop the next version of the eoc ai architecture and engage with the stakeholder to identify new cases and requirements and also analyze the governance model for the eoc ai this has a lot of interactions with other task forces we foresee that task forces will work jointly, that will, um, I mean, share information and share uh, approaches and even uh, co-develop uh, documents and specifications which are quite related. So the next one is the task force on infrastructure for quality research software. So and this task force is, has a very clear aim to develop and the, I mean, to, to work on, the, on foster development and deployment of tools and services to allow a properly archiving references description of research software with all the metadata specifications and the standards in the area, but also to improve the quality, both from the technical and organizational point of view. And for them, they expect to work in this two year plan that all these task forces have proposed uh, to actively engage with the scholarly infrastructure providers for research software to explore tools, standards, platforms using in the state of the art software development to make an special emphasis on evaluating the quality and formulate actionable recommendations for increasing the quality and to ensure the reuse and the um, usability of the software producer, which is, is becoming a key asset, as you know, in all this EOS ecosystem in order to consume properly uh, the data and have a, a good, uh, um, I mean, uh, usage of the resources and finally to standard to identify standard basis best practices to write this quality research uh, software which i will say what i was mentioning of the quantitative and quantitative methodologies to evaluate uh, this uh, uh, the quality in some way so last but not least the largest task force that we have in the in all the advisory groups is the technical interoperability of data and service task force they intentionally wanted to have an inclusive task force because um, the, the objective was twofold. In one side, um, it, this task force is very technical and implementation, implementation oriented. So it was very important to have the maximum number of representation from all the projects, from all the initiatives that were that are collaborating in the building of EOC, right? So the main objective is to, ta to, 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 to take this EOC interoperability framework and evolve to a technical architecture for the EOC core and the EOC exchange, which are the two main parts, the two main groups of services that complement this interoperability framework in the building of the global architecture. The other objective of having this large um, I mean, membership is to have an endorsing. I mean, if the results that the results coming out from the task force will be um, assigned or will be considered by a wider uh, community, because it's very important that the results are widely adopted and are considered by the maximum number of initiatives. So the opus that they expect is have, first have the first principle document and a landscape overview, and then a technical architecture description with all the inventory of data of services, specifications, protocols, etc. in several steps in the draft version and a final version. Then, as you can see, these are quite aligned with other activities. So that was the end of my uh, short description of the task forces. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ignacio. OK, so I will move us on um, with the third advisory group, which is metadata and equality. Um, and within this, we have two task forces, um, one on fair metrics and data quality and one on semantic interoperability. And as I mentioned in the introduction, um, both task forces opted to engage with the participants as much as possible. So semantic interoperability recommended to, to accept all of the applications 
Within Fair Metrics, we wanted to, to keep a smaller group, so around 25 people. So we made a selection based on the relevant skill set. Um, but there is a request that those wider pool of applications become some form of consultation group, because we found um, all of the CVs were actually relevant and brought some kind of useful skills. So we want to make sure that we, we have that wider engagement, even if the membership is a little bit smaller. So within the Fair Metrics and Data Quality Group, um, the main activities here are really implementing the Fair Metrics. So within the previous um, executive board, there was a recommendation on Fair Metrics for EOSC, which took largely the, the RDA Fair um, Data Maturity Model took those metrics and derived a subset of them that was most applicable for EOSC. And we want to take that recommendation and apply it across all the different research communities so that we can test how appropriate those metrics are, that none of them are providing a barrier to uptake or um, discounting certain groups or making it problematic for them to engage in EOSC. The other aspect that's really important for the Fair Metrics group is trialing different tools Naturally, you want to make it easy to, to identify the extent to which you're being fair and the extent to which you're, you know, you're measuring and matching up to these different metrics. Um, so we do need as much automation as possible. But then there's also always a risk when you have automated tools that it's very easy to game the system. So we want to do um, work around that and explore some of the potential challenges and, and try and make a recommendation for an approach to tooling within EOS. And as a result of these two activities, um, there is likely to be updates needed to the metrics. So we'll liaise with the RDA Fair Data Maturity Model Working Group on those. The aspect of the, the charter that's kind of a little bit more um, new, I would say, in, in this group is the aspect of data quality, because this hasn't really been addressed within EOSC yet. Um, so we are planning to conduct a state of art, state of the art to understand um, the different measures of data quality in different research communities so that we can try and identify some common features and dimensions um, through a series of case studies and based on that make a recommendation for an approach to data quality within the EOSC. And actually when we were selecting the members we did prioritize um, people who had experience around working in data quality because this is an area that there's less expertise, I would say, in the current EOS community, and we wanted to make sure that we're addressing this. So for both the fair metrics and the data quality angles of this task force, um, they plan to do several test cases, testing different tools, looking at different quality assessments, um, and they're going to put out a series of papers for community input, first at month 12, but then another iteration of the main recommendations um, at month 18. And there's a, one key overlap, I think, um, is with the EOSC Rules of Participation group, because we're going to have to make sure that whatever metrics are defined and whatever quality criteria or benchmarks we expect people to meet in, eventually become part of those rules of participation. And there'll also be a close alignment with um, the software group because we also need um, metrics for fair software. And then in terms of semantic interoperability, um, the aim here, there's already a strong piece of work that came out of the former governance, the interoperability framework, which is being picked up by the FAIRS FAIR project. But this group will be the, um, looking specifically at the semantic interoperability layer of, of that framework and looking at how to further develop and implement those recommendations in alignment with um, EOS Future and other kind of national initiatives that are looking at data discovery and, and the kind of understanding of data. So they'll be doing work to recommend common metadata standards, how to support these through various catalogues, and also looking at how the different crosswalks between standards should be enacted so that we can align and match the different semantic artifacts. And similar to the Fair Metrics group, this group will be organizing various workshops and hackathons to explore different case studies um, and have this iterative cycle of development of recommendations in 2022. They've already um, identified several groups to be working on these several disciplinary clusters and national initiatives and different cross-cutting projects like FAIRS FAIR. 
Um, but again, you know, the charter is only really a starting point. They're open to suggestions from the community for, for other case studies too. And I think within this group, there's a need to align very strongly with the architecture task force and with different implementation projects, because this semantic interoperability kind of layer is a core part of, of that implementation. So that's the, the work that will be happening on the two groups. The other thing I wanted to touch on briefly is the areas of the Shriya, um, which are relevant to these task forces. And I think because FAIR has been a kind of key objective within EOSC for such a long time, it's quite well reflected within the Shriya. So in terms of metadata and ontologies, um, there are priorities within the Shriya to develop governance structures for coordinating the work on developing ontologies, um, both within specific research communities and that overall coordination when we're looking at the generic standards like DCAT or schema.org and, and how we map across different standards. Um, there's also a priority to develop guidelines for a minimum metadata description, um, which is something that's happening through the FES, through the EOS Future project now, um, and supporting registries of metadata schema and ontologies and services that build on those registries. I think there's still a fair amount of work to happen in this space. Some things will be covered by the forthcoming work program, um, but I think certainly, um, you know, actually having all of those different registries in place and having governance of those um, is something where there's still quite a lot of work to be done. And then in terms of fair metrics, the priorities here have been to test um, the metrics that have been put forward and to fine tune those recommendations. And I think one of the things that was put forward as a priority in uh, the Shriya was establishing a neutral forum for the governance of the EOSC fair metrics um, and making sure that you know we're, we're able to update these. So like we had the rules of participation compliance um, group kind of setting up a board for implementing um, those rules, I think this is something we'll need to do for the fair metrics work in time too. Um, Again, the development of automated tools is one of the priority areas in the Shriya, being mindful of the different risks and biases there. Um, and then also supporting the definition of FAIR for software. Now, this naturally links to the, the software group um, that's already been, um, been discussed. But I think this is an area that maybe isn't prioritized in the Shriya as much, the kind of software infrastructure. So it might be something that we want to kind of build in. And then providing guidelines for the different service providers as well, so that we can implement um, these metrics on FAIR. Now, one aspect in the Shriya that is in our task force remits, but really isn't covered very, very much aside from the opening principles is this aspect of data quality. So again, this might be an area where we think more priorities are, are needed in the Shriya and the forthcoming work programs. So that the content we have within EOSC and we're using and relying on is content that can be trusted. So I think some of those governance aspects and the data quality aspects are maybe areas we need to emphasize in future. So um, that's all for the metadata um, and data quality group. I will now hand over to Gustav to speak to us about the research careers and curricula. Thank you very much. Uh, so as uh, Sarah mentioned before, I am one of the four coordinators of the task force on research careers, recognition and credits. Uh, there are also the task forces on data stewardship curricula and career paths and the task force on upskilling countries to engage in EOSC uh, under this AG. And uh, I'm going to start with the task force on data stewardship curricula and career paths. Uh, this group uh, has chosen to work on a timeline of 24 months, uh, like the other two groups uh, in this AG. Uh, 25 members have been appointed. And the main activities that are envisaged are, first of all, to identify stakeholders and related initiatives. Next, to clarify the terminology around data stewards and data stewardship in different contexts. So this uh, concept has many different meanings, as we all know. And rather than trying to find an agreed definition, this group is intending to embrace the um, uh, richness of uh, uh, 
terminology in different uh, disciplinary and other contexts. They will then proceed to define minimal data stewardship curricula, including definitions of data stewards roles, core activities, possible specializations and extensions, and the particular context in which these roles operate. They will develop a competency profile for data stewardship, and they will define levels of training needed by the different data steward roles, speaking again to uh, differentiation. Uh, and uh, finally, they will make recommendations for data steward career paths directed both at the individual, at research performing organizations, uh, and other organizations uh, on how to establish career paths for data stewards, uh, as well as providing recommendations for the recognition and rewards for data stewardship activities. So this task force obviously has um, considerable uh, ties with the other two in the same AG, and uh, uh, all three have uh, as well an important connection to the task force on researcher engagement and adoption. The task force on upskilling countries to engage in EOSC uh, has 26 members. Uh, their main uh, planned activities are firstly to develop a scoping instrument for comparing skills and education between countries uh, at a national level. Uh, then they will iteratively uh, apply this scoping instrument uh, to uh, selected countries as case uh, studies uh, initially to test and refine it and then uh, finally to conduct an analysis and make suggestions for upskilling open science at the national level uh, directed at the uh, various uh, at the different european countries uh, also as a main activity they have listed supporting the dialogue of stakeholders this is of course very important in uh, in all of these uh, efforts uh, both these task forces speak to uh, primarily a set of priorities in the SRIA that can be found uh, in section 6.4, uh, developing the next generation of open science and data professionals, bridging the education gap, coordinating and aligning curricula for students and researchers, building a trusted and long lasting knowledge hub of learning materials and related tools, and uh, lastly, influencing national open science policy for skills by supporting strategic leaders. The task force on uh, researcher careers recognition and credit has 27 members. And uh, what we are planning to do in this group is uh, firstly, a landscape analysis of existing high level initiatives and a gap analysis of research needs uh, on uh, how to recognize and incentivize researchers. We will identify principles and provide recommendations targeted to different stakeholders for improving recognition systems and credit uh, this will include uh, research performing organizations, funders, national governments, and others. And there is going to be a cons consultation mechanism for stakeholders, uh, which we have not defined in detail yet, but it's uh, very important uh, to uh, have this different stakeholders' views represented in this work. Finally, this group will define a future monitoring strategy for the implementation of recommendations and practices and possibly also tools and supporting mechanisms. And this speaks to priorities in the SRIA, primarily in the section 6.5, uh, which is to, uh, and I quote, change the narrative around careers in academia uh, to focus less on individual competitiveness and more on collaborative and team-based approaches. Uh, to reduce the focus on narrow metrics and uh, to highlight one more uh, point out of the text, uh, to uh, promote signing and or implementation by research performing organizations of initiatives such as uh, the, de the Declaration on Research Assessment, DORA, the Leiden Manifesto and the Hong Kong Principles. Uh, that's all from me, uh, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Gustav. So last but not least, um, Bob speaking about the uh, sustainable, sustaining EOSC advisory group. Yeah, great. Thanks very much, Sarah. So good morning, everybody. Uh, you'll be pleased to know I am the last one, so you won't have too much more information overload. And covering the sustainability uh, aspects of sustaining EOSC, 
there have been two task forces defined in this advisory group. So sustainable financing and long-term data preservation. Now, before telling you in detail what that really means, I think there's probably a couple of overarching points that they, that will make you understand what's behind both of these. I think the first thing is considering that they're, these task forces are looking beyond project-based funding. Remember that the partnership that's been defined for EOSC is looking at, the, at a, about a decade of time in what's being set up. Um, so we have to look beyond what's in the current short-term project funding, be that project funding at a European level, be it at a national level, or be it at an institutional level. For everybody to engage with EOSC as service providers, as users, and as uh, data providers, they have to be convinced that EOSC is going to be around long enough in order for them to be able to profit from it and contribute to it. So those are the key elements that link these different task forces together. Um, looking specifically um, at these two points, you know, a key input will be the results that came out of the previous executive board, in particular, a report called the Solutions for Sustainable EOSC, otherwise known as the Fair Lady Report, and exploring the sort of funding models that will enable the long-term financial sustainability to build and sustain the key EOSC elements that go into the overall architecture and ecosystem. Of course, as well, the long-term open data archives and the preservation services are required to enable sustainable EOSC and sustainable access to the data. And that's a key point which is highlighted in the, the SRIA document. So the sustainable financing uh, charter drafting coordinators, they've selected 30 members that have demonstrated uh, via their submissions sufficient expertise and experience in relevant areas. And the long-term data preservation charter drafting coordinators have endorsed all 32 of the applicants uh, that they received. So you see in both cases, we're talking around about uh, 30 uh, participants in these, um, in these task forces. So looking at sustainable financing, the objective is to produce by 2023 a proposal for the long-term financial sustainability of the main building blocks of EOS. What are those main building blocks? Well, we've got the EOS Core, have you somebody heard about, the Exchange, and of course, the Federation of Data and Data Services and develop and validate scenarios for financial sustainability of these building blocks and somehow validate the feasibility of these scenarios with the, with the relevant stakeholders. Remember, we're not just talking about EC engagement here. We're talking about engagement of the whole community. So all the different stakeholders have to engage and be ready to commit to this sustainability model and ensure it's aligned with the national and European level policies and legislation. Okay. Then if we look at the long-term data preservation, so you know, in alignment with what's in the SRIA document, the task force will provide recommendations on the vision and sustainable implementation of long-term data preservation policies and practices, including suggestions for subsequent uh, European Open Science Cloud strategy periods. Remember, it was divided into three different phases or periods, and they want to see what is possible at each of those different phases. So important things they'll be looking at are the roles and responsibilities of the different stakeholders um, concerning long-term data preservation. And of course, it's linked, linked to the uh, uh, sustainable financing model because we have to figure out who's going to pay for the uh, long-term data preservation and which of the stakeholders are responsible for different aspects of it. Okay? The output they're expecting is a, a shared understanding and vision of what long-term data preservation means in the context of EOSC, mapping of the roles, responsibilities, and accountabilities uh, across the different stakeholders, and recommendations for a European network of trustworthy digital repositories, along with recommendations for data services to connect to that work, and a roadmap for future um, development of long-term data preservation with those uh, um, uh, trusted repositories. So I'll stop there, keep it short, and we can discuss further as we go along. Excellent. Thank you very much, Bob. And thanks to all the different panelists. Um, so now it's time for you to, you know, ask questions, make observations, reflect on some of those strategic priorities or things that you think are missing. Um, so I'll open the floor. 
I know we've bombarded you with lots of information, but hopefully some of that is uh, digested through and raised some questions in your mind. So by all means, put things in the chat or raise a hand or even nicer, switch on your video so we can see you. <laughs> so any questions from the from the floor? Or maybe you think we have it all sorted and everything we've proposed is the right approach. Maybe one question I'll put to the panel as you're all thinking of things to, to ask or to say is where, where you see potential like strategic gaps. So we, we have the work that's happening through the task forces, but we also have to have this longer term vision of where we're going 2023, 2025, um, and to give feedback to the commission on that. Um, so I wondered if you have reflections. So I noted when I was going through the, the work for the task force, um, task forces on fair metrics and data quality, and also semantic interoperability, there's already quite a lot of activity going on within the different um, projects funded by the work program. Um, but I think data quality is a gap in this area. So that's maybe something we want to emphasize in future work um, because it's focusing more on the kind of research community or disciplinary angle. Whereas I think a lot of the work programs that we're based in are, are much more on the technical and infrastructure and service provider side. But I think we can't ignore those data quality angles in EOSC. So that's maybe one area. And I think the, the software infrastructure is something that we've noted in the SRIA and picked up on in the task force here, but it's, it's not a kind of key action area that we have. So that's maybe a gap. But I don't know if any of the other panelists want to reflect on that thoughts you'd had to looking through the remits of your groups or where you see work going. If I can take it, Sarah. So, yeah, um, yeah uh, I will even expand. I mean, I totally agree with you that data quality is key because data quality is also key for interoperability of data. I mean, we have to mm -hmm. standardize quality measurements in order to make the data interoperable. I work a lot on the medical imaging area and data quality is key in this part in order to make to get knowledge from the different and create larger uh, data sets. Uh, but the quality, I will, I will expand the, the concept of the quality to all the areas. I think that quality of the services, quality of the software, quality of all the, of all the assets that we are developing is key. And this is something that industry has a lot of maturity in evaluating the quality of the, the product, something that we have to learn and will boost the reuse of our assets for sure. Excellent. Thanks very much, Ignacio. Any other reflections from the, the other panelists on your areas, Bob? Yeah, yeah so staying on the area of, of, first of all, data quality, fully agree with, with Ignacio. And, and we have to understand that it, it's, um, it varies very much from community, research community, from one research community to another. But also have to remember that um, what one group considers to be mediocre quality may be sufficient for some other use cases um, which they hadn't thought about before. So, you know, we shouldn't be excluding people's data just because um, from one point of view, it's not considered a high enough quality. The, um, the other elements that, uh, that um, that links to for me is also this idea of widening the user base. Uh, we have been very much focused in our consultations and so on on the well-established research communities who are, let's, let's put it clear, are the ones that are the best prepared in order to engage with EOSC at this moment in time, okay? Because there's still a lot of legwork that needs to be done. But as we're going forward, we have to see how we can expand that user base. We've discussed in some parts of the Sri and so on, things like the, the longer tail of science, um, citizen scientists as well, but also the idea of um, how can EOSC serve the wider public sector, starting with uh, education, for example, but also then um, the relevance of it to different business sectors as well. Yeah, and already, I mean, the EOSC Association Board is collaborating with Direx to see how we can 
work with those relevant different initiatives. And I think that will be a key kind of area of activity for us. So Carolina's put a comment in the chat. I'm very interested in technical interoperability and the sustainability. It's great that you, to hear that you have a have it on the agenda in the task force. Yeah, I, th I think technical interoperability is one of the key um, aspects for EOSC. Um, so there's already been quite a lot of work in the e-infrastructure projects around that and certainly within the new EOSC future project. So I recommend looking at that because that's really the kind of main um, implementation of EOSC. So implementing the core and the key technical um, interoperability to allow us to federate the data and services. Um, and then the sustainability, I think this has been a, a key challenging area. There's been a lot of work done in the previous sustainability working group and in this forthcoming task force. But I think really having effective resourcing models um, and allowing the kind of cross-border use of services or use from communities that are not the core remit of the organization, providing those services is very difficult. So I think, you know, we haven't cracked that nut yet that's uh, a big piece of work still to do and it's something that will be picked up as well um you know by the association through collaborating with its members and the the kind of forthcoming um coordination and support action which works alongside the, the association will have um activities around these kind of resourcing models too Any other questions? I see some things coming from Mark um, Sessebauer. Um, some communities or research fields are seriously behind in data storage, and especially in sharing raw data and carefully describing these data. I know there are several task forces focused on informing those people about new options in EOSC, but is there any resource um, about where to find information about the level of data management in diverse research communities? This way, I know how to help my colleagues doing diverse research. I'm responsible for implementing EOSC policies in an extremely multidisciplinary institute. So um, I can I can certainly make a reflection on that. If anyone else from the panel wants to to come in, by all means do. In the previous um, executive board, there were five working groups, and the one on on fair um, did a study looking at the essentially the fairness within different research communities. So to what extent had communities self-organized, developed their standards, developed their approaches to ensure that, you know, when a large amount of data is generated on a particular instrument, there are protocols about how to store that, who gets access to that and when, how is it licensed, all of these aspects. Um, so there's a study that I'll, I'll pop a link in the chat in a moment. It's called something like six case studies on um, the fairness of, of data. And it's looking at the kind of approach across different research communities, the key challenges or barriers faced by those different communities. Um, I think there's also been other studies done either in within institutional contexts or, or also by the clusters. So, you know, the likes of Embry Fair and um, Elixir and the other kind of research clusters are looking at the work within different research disciplines. So they, I'm sure, also have studies of the extent to which people are fair or, you know, what the key challenges people face are. Um, any other reflections on, on that question? Yeah, I can add a li little bit this. Um, the, the, Mark's text specifically referred to raw data. Yeah. Um, and that very much depends on the discipline. Okay. Um, so, for, speaking of my, in my own case here at CERN, okay, there's the CERN open data portal, right? And you can get access to petabytes of data in the, uh, via this portal. I'll give you the link. Okay. And so anybody can, can use that data make use of it for the for education for research and so on um, but it's not the raw data itself because we we've, we've collected not far from an exabyte of data now right um, making that amount of raw data available to to anybody so that it can be used and made sense of is an extremely difficult task so the approach which is used in physics, and I don't think physics is alone in this, there are other disciplines that are doing the same, is they look at it in different levels of data, how much processing has gone on into the data, 
uh, and the analysis of it. And then they sort of show the resulting analysis and the analysis methods to access summaries of the data, uh, which is more manageable for people and can still be used uh, in that sense. Um, and I think that's that's one of the areas which uh, has to be taken into account. There is, depending on the nature of the of the discipline, there are different approaches, but also getting access to it fair. Uh, uh, Sarah, you mentioned uh, elect, the work of Elixir and so on. Um, there's also the escape cluster, which has adopted a data lake model um, and is making data from a num number of different disciplines, astroparticle physics, uh, astronomy, IG physics, and so on, are making available um, subsets um, of their uh, data via this data lake model, where uh, it is accessible to outside parties as well in such a manner. Excellent. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, and I've popped that link in the chat to you as well, Mark. And certainly trying to collate these things on one site would definitely be useful. That's one of our eternal um, challenges with EOSC, I think, because there's so much um, that's happened through various projects or in different, um, different aspects of the governance, so it's not necessarily collated together. Um, Patrick Furr has asked a question as well, how is EOS going to liaise with other initiatives around the world, like open research infrastructures, for instance, and I'd maybe throw some, you know, parallel initiatives to EOS in there, like the ARDC, um, or uh, the work that's happening in China, the CST cloud or, or others. Who would like to take this one? I can reflect on it if nobody else wants to. I can just say one very, I mean, very simple and clear thing that we have a, a metric in our EOC Association of International Cooperation. And it's something that we have to clearly address. Uh, I mean, it will be full to uh, work on this global world without considering all the work that is going outside of Europe. It's true that we have to organize ourselves first to be, I mean, to be competitive and to be able to provide, uh, um, I mean, the information, but we have to look to very carefully what all the people are doing all over the world in order to uh, feedback this information. Actually, it's important to say that the association is not bounded to European countries. Uh, any other can act as a, can participate as, an, as a, an observer. And we have participated in the task forces from outside of Europe that we will build, help a lot on, on implementing the, this path. I just come back to unmute myself. I was just popping stuff in the chat. Um, thank you very much, Ignacio. So, so yeah, one one forum we've been using um, for that international collaboration is the Research Data Alliance. So there's a group there, the Global Open Research Commons um, Interest, which is trying to draw together EOSC and parallel initiatives to EOSC, so the likes of ARDC or CST Cloud, and trying to see um, what work we're each doing, where there's comparable um, areas of activity and how we can collaborate on defining common standards and implementations so that we're not working in silos um, because the research community is global. So we need our infrastructures to, to interact and interoperate as well. Um, but I think a lot of it comes down to just having spaces where we can communicate and collaborate what work we're doing and, and having the opportunity to meet with the relevant peers from those different international initiatives. So I think RDA is good for that. There's also co-data groups. And I think there's a, a new board that's been trying to set up um, with the kind of leadership of each of these initiatives. So I see Anka's put a question in. Sustaining EOSC is a very delicate subject that's been explored since the inception of EOSC from EOSC pilot work to Tin Man and Fair Lady reports. Nevertheless, no clear plans have emerged. What, what new strategy does the sustainability task force bring? A challenging question for you, Bob. Yeah, so let, let's put it a little bit in context to say that no new plan, clear plans have emerged, right? Compared to when this work started to where we are now, in between, we now have the outline of the architecture of EOSC. And one of the important things that happened, which will help the sustainability model, is the separation of the core from the exchange. Okay, The core is a rather limited 
set of federated services intended to be used by all research communities. Okay, so that is something that you can imagine needs to be funded in common across everybody. Okay, so then we can start to look at how that can be funded collectively across the different research communities and countries uh, and disciplines. Okay. Then there's the exchange. Nobody says that anybody has to use stuff out of the exchange. Nobody says you have to use everything in the exchange, right? And it, it, it is a sort of, um, by its definition, you can pick and choose out of those ones. And these documents highlight that there may be different funding models for the services and artifacts that one finds in that exchange. So it's left the door open so that people can be imaginative of how they can fund those individual and different services. At the other side of that, we also now have the partnership in place. The partnership um, is a commitment from many of the organizations inside the association, along with uh, the European Commission, towards a long-term view of EOS. So those elements together were not there two or three years ago. So there have been some advances. And while it's true, we don't have a final model exactly in place. I'm pretty confident that the work that's going on inside the sustainability um, uh, uh, task force will be able to advance the question further. We have a governance model which is ready to discuss these questions as well, engagements with the member states and so on. So, you know, I think we can be optimistic that something will come out of these things as well. Yeah, I think in certain areas like this, it's actually quite a slow burn because you're dealing with quite a diverse set of services. You know, like you say, what needs to be there as a core for anything to operate and function is very different to, you know, services where you've got multiple different options. So all of your data analysis tools and, and so forth and where naturally different research communities will want to pick different options. So so we need a whole range of, of different options there. Um, but yeah, I think hopefully uh, we will have different models that we can test in these forthcoming projects um, and actually get something more more viable because it's certainly a, one of the main challenging areas of EOSC. Okay, any further questions anyone would, would like to raise? Or further reflections from panelists on, on things that have been said? So Carolina is asking where you can find the list of EOSC Association members. Um, I'm pretty sure we have the members listed on EOSC.eu. There's like a members page, um, so I can pop oh, that in the chat. Um, uh, super, thank you very much. Uh, so within the association, there are members and observers, um, and they're typically you know, either service providing organizations, universities, research performing funders, or they might be kind of advocacy bodies. So you can find here um, the, the details of all the different um, members in our GA. And then the observers, um, you know, have a, they don't have the full rights of a member, they don't have the same voting rights, um, but they can still take part in the task forces and, and be involved in the EOSC and steering things. Okay, we are kind of coming up. I haven't heard of us having anyone in the association. Yeah, I don't know what organization you're from, Carolina, but by all means, we can we can cross check. Um, and actually one point that's maybe important to make, to be involved in EOSC itself, you don't have to be involved in the association. So the association is there as the, the kind of governance and we are a membership body. Um, and then through from that membership, we elect a board to try and help you know, steer things. Um, but people don't have to be a member or an observer of the association to be involved in EOSC at large. So there are various EOSC projects. We still have stakeholder registry that anyone can be part of. You don't have to be a, a signed up member of the organization um, to, to take part in that. So it's a kind of a collective initiative, but I think certain organizations want more of an influence on the development of EOSC and this is why they, they think it's important to be involved in the association. 
Okay, I think I may bring the session to a close because we seem to have naturally run run out of the questions. So I'd like to just thank the, the panelists for talking through the different task forces, encourage you all to, to look at those charters and to get involved as those task forces start their work. You will see information um, through the EOSC Association website and um, through the newsletter. So if you're not um, already on the stakeholder registry or you haven't signed up to the newsletter I'd encourage you to, to do so um, and so I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference so thanks to Ilaria and her colleagues for organizing this and giving us a platform to speak and um, yeah we will speak to you all soon thank you very much thanks everybody thanks Bye.